All right. Um, again, Don Shinklin, Propel Insurance. Uh, I'm a partner at Propel. I work out of the Portland office, but um, we do business all over the United States. Um, as uh, Lily said, please feel free to ask any questions while I'm going through this, um, and I'll gladly answer uh, if I can, or we'll um, get back to you. Uh, this is our agenda today. Uh, principles of surety ship, surety versus insurance, the three C's of surety, basic understanding of financial statements, internal systems, underwriters review, and theme things to consider when selecting a bond agent. Um, and these are just basic, but I'm just going to kind of fly through them so we can get to the better part of the presentation. But uh, a surety bond is a three-party agreement whereby the surety assures an obligee, obligee that the principal will complete an underlying obligation. Um, oftentimes, um, surety and insurance are intertwined, but they are completely different. And, you know, in this picture, I'm just trying to illustrate uh, the picture on the left, it's uh, the Tower of Pisa. As you can see, it's leaning to the left and who knows whether that was intentional or not. Um, but in this instance, if it, you know, the project, it wasn't supposed to go that way, the surety bond will step in to make sure it's corrected and or fixed. Uh, on the right, you have a car accident, you get into a car accident, you pay insurance premiums, the insurance companies pays to get your car fixed and the other car if you're at fault. We'll go into these a little deeper um, as we continue. Um, how a surety is different from insurance. Um, a surety is a three-party agreement to where the insurance is a two-party agreement. You have insurance, you have the owner, the insurance company, and usually a general contractor. In insurance, you have just the insurance company and the client who's purchasing the insurance. Um, surety sureties are fee-based premiums, um, usually coming at a rate per thousand, um, and it's based on the contract amount itself where the insurance premiums are based off of actuarial data that divides the premium that you pay on insurance. Um, Non-payment does not affect liability on the surety side, whereas non-payment on the insurance side results in cancellations or notice of cancellation. Um, liability, our surety companies assume no losses. They are assuming that a general contractor is going to apply for a bond, get the bond, and finish the project according to the contract that was signed. Um, for insurance, you have actuaries. They expect losses to happen. They just try to control it, and that's where you'll get an adjustment of a rate or not. I mean, right now, um, all of you that have commercial auto policies are probably experiencing some increase in premiums due to what's going on in the marketplace. Um, for years, the auto on the auto insurance side, companies were not charging enough, and the claims got to be, well, as the cars got more technology in them, they got to be more expensive to replace, and they were not charging enough in premiums to cover the cost. So you would start to see some increases in rates on the auto, and that's where we are right now. Um, once a bond has been placed, it's non-cancellable. It's designed to be in place the entire length of a project to where insurance is cancelable. And there is a variety of things that could lead to a cancellation of insurance. Um, it's not something that you want, but it does happen. Insurance companies sometimes have a change in appetite um, from one class of business to the other. If that class of business was not profitable, uh, the likelihood that that insurance company is going to get off of that class of business is pretty high. Um, surety bonds must be in writing to where insurance may or may not be in writing. And that's just, you know, to give you guys a little bit of difference between surety and insurance. Um, a surety is a three-party relationship. At the top, you have the surety you have the principal or contractor and you have the obligee, which is the owner. In the middle sits the bond. It's based on an underlying contract. The principles of surety ship. The surety 
provides credit in form of a bond. The insurity is indemnified by the principal against loss. Um, the surety is indemnified by the principal against loss. That's a big. Um, indemnities are one of the main sections I feel that are overlooked when companies are looking, or company owners are looking at getting bonding. Um, it's something that's, you know, you sign a bunch of papers and you're off, but you really want to understand the indemnity agreement because that's where all of the risk is for the owner. Owners oftentimes are having to put up everything, um, both corporate and personally, when they're going out to get bonds. The obligee is the owner of the upstream contractor that has assurance that their obligation will be met and gets a pre-qualification that the principal can complete the job. This is all of the underwriting that goes on um, when surety companies are looking to lend surety credits to a construction com contractor. Uh, the principal is granted credit and is responsible for fulfilling their obligation to both the obligee and the surety. You have a couple of different types of construction bonds. Most often in, in this scenario, you have bid bonds and payment and performance bonds. Um, a lot of times when you're looking at project specs, they're gonna ask for a bid bond. Bid bond is a way for an owner of a project to make sure that our construction company is solid from a financial standpoint and that they're gonna be around to be able to finish the bond. Bid bonds provide financial assurance that the bid has been submitted in good faith and that the contractor intends to enter into a contract at the price bid and provide the required performance and payment bonds. Performance and, pay, and, performance and pay, payment bonds usually combine into one form which guarantees that the contractor will complete the job in accordance to their contract and that they will pay their subcontractors, laborers, and suppliers. I've got a question that just came in. Sure. The question is, how can you as the owner get out of the indemnification? Uh, typically, when you have indemnification, the only way that an owner is going to get out of indemnification is to have a really good balance sheet and a really good history of showing strong performances on jobs. And typically what happens is somewhere in the relationship that's usually down the road, the surety and the agent will meet and there will be a graded decrease of indemnity. So year one, it may decrease just throwing round numbers. Let's say it's a million bucks. You're, you know, it's an indemnity of a million bucks in the overall program. They will tear it down to eventually be release the owner from any indemnity, indemnity but typically when that happens, there are strongholds that the financial condition must stay to a certain level in order for that owner to be released of any indemnity. The indemnity side is saying that, you know, if I'm providing you bonds, you go out and perform the work. If there's an accident or you become unable to finish the project, I, the surety, will come in, finish the project you, the contractor who have the bond will reimburse or indemnify the surety company of any and all expenses to get that contract finished per the contract. Um, does that answer the question? So in other words, it's really hard. Um, unless there's a lot of cash, cash is always keen. Um, if the company is in a really, really, really good financial position, sometimes you can start to draw down that indemnity, but it's rare. Thank you. Um, in payment and performance bonds, you also have defaults. Uh, in case of default, the surety has the option to remedy by either pay the penal sum to the owner, or if the contractor was experiencing some hardship from a financial standpoint, but the surety still has confidence in that contractor, sometimes they will fund the contractor to finish their obligations or sometimes the surety will hire another contractor to come in and complete the job. And whatever that new contractor that came in to complete the job is paid, the surety pays them, that's the portion that's expected to be paid back to the surety from the owner who posted that bond. In 
indemnity agreement. I spoke of this earlier. It's an agreement between the surety and the contractor that outlines contractor's financial responsibility to the surety in event of a loss. Um, a contractor signs personally and corporately. Owners and spouses with greater than 10% ownership typically will have to sign. And I know this is where, you know, I, I get a, the question a lot. It's like, well, you know, I'm married and my spouse doesn't have an interest in the business. They don't do anything. Can we leave them off? And that question is no. And I don't know when it happened, but some time ago, um, there was only one owner required to sign the indemnity. And what happened is there was a big loss and the owner knew that the loss was coming. So behind closed doors, he went and signed all of the assets over to his wife. When the claim came, they paid out on the claim and they went to collect or to be indemnified. And the owner no longer had any financials because he had transferred it to his wife. So that's why um, owners, spouses, and anyone with greater than 10% ownership will have to sign the indemnity agreement. Signers of the agreement of the agreements must repay the surety for any paid loss the surety makes on behalf of, of the contractor. And, and this is where it gets, um, where you wanna pay a lot of attention because you know, if you're on that job that is looking like it's going to be a very difficult job and maybe, you know, you hadn't done that type of construction or very little, you want to make sure that you understand the scope of the job that you're applying for a bond because, you know, I've seen insurance or uh, surety companies come in and take everything. It's happened on a couple of my clients and it's just not a good situation all the way around, but, um, you know, in a way, the sureties like the IRS, they're going to come and get their money if they have to pay. This brings us to the three C's of surety, character, capacity, and capital. And in most cases, there should be a fourth um, C on here that's cash, because cash is always king. Um, character, you know, these three, the three C's of surety is really important when, when underwriters are looking or underwriting a company. The moral and ethical nature of an individual or business entity. Honesty and integrity, you know, that's what they're, you know, what I mean with my, my clients and I, I'm looking at the surety, I try to always introduce the surety to the client face-to-face -face, because the, the surety also wants to see what type of business owners they're working with. They're looking for that honesty and integrity. They're looking for their personal and business. You know, they're looking to make sure that the trade payment records um, are being made on time. Um, they want to see, you know, oftentimes you'll be asked for personal financial statements. They want to see that you've been professional. I mean, that you've been successful in business and that you are acquiring assets. You know, oftentimes I see uh, personal financial statements and there's so much that's left out. And when you give a dumbed down personal financial statement, it has nothing on there. The surety company is looking like, man, he's been in years for 25 years and this is all that he's been able to accumulate. What's going on? Um, it, it takes into consideration a lot on the character side. Trade payment records. Um, you guys should be monitoring your Dun and Bradstreet. Um, accounts. I know oftentimes it's missed by contractors, um, but a lot of financial institutions rely on the Dun & Bradstreet. And I'm not a fan of it, but it's, you know, you have to keep it clean. You want to get it cleaned up. And it it's not fair because it seems if you've never had anything to do with Dun & Bradstreet and you go and look and you have all these false things on there, you then will have to pay to get those taken off in most cases. But you wanna make sure that you are paying attention to your Dun & Bradstreet for your company because it's like the credit report for your business. And they wanna make sure that you have a sense of commitment that you're gonna keep your word in doing the things you say you're gonna do or the things that you commit to. That's on the character side. You have capacity the contractor's ability to perform a project successfully. You know, prior experience and performance record. They want to see what kind of profit margins you've been making on jobs. Have you, you know, bid jobs and hit the profit margin that you say you're going to hit on a job? Um, do you have experience in this particular field that you want this bid bond for? Have you done that type of work? Or has it just been smaller 
jobs, the same line of work, but it's more of it. That's okay. They just want to know that you have that experience. Um, organization. Um, we've got a few questions. Sorry. Okay. We've got a few questions. Um, and it was about the Dun and Brad Street that you just uh, talked about. One of the questions is, what does the Dun and Brad Street report actually show? And then the next question is, um, do you have to tell your suppliers and vendors to report or do they know to report it to Dun and Brad Street? I think they automatically report to the Dun and Brad Street. Um, you know, the Dun and Brad Street shows your payment history. It's almost like your personal credit report. It's going to show your payment records to all of the vendors that you do business with. I can't say personally that they all report to the Dun and Brad Street, but I know that a lot of them do report to the Dun and Brad Street. And what was the other question, Tanya? Um, well, the second question was if, if they needed to tell their suppliers to report it, or do they just know to report it to Dun & Bradstreet? Oh, yeah, I don't think you have to um, tell them to support. I think that they automatically report. Some of the small ones may not, but it's the same as in your credit report. Some are going to report, some aren't. If they're not, then it's not harming you. Um, but if they are reporting negative things of late payments or whatnot, then that does hurt you. Okay, and then the last one is, if there is anything negative on the report, it is up to the individual, the owner of the company to fight that. Is that correct? That is correct. And oftentimes when there's something that's um, incorrect on your Dun & Bradshaw report, usually it does result in you having to pay some money to remove the negative things on your credit report, unfortunately. Okay, and we can actually help with that. So if anybody has that, please let us know. We can help you with that. Oh, um, I have just one question because I heard this clue report, C-L-U-E report. Is that something that the surety insurance um, industry use? Yeah, different sureties will use different reporting. Um, and I think the clue report is similar to the Dun & Bradstreet, just like we have TransUnion, Equifax. It's just another entity that's being reported to on the financial side on accounts. Um, is that all of the questions for now? That's all I have right now. Thank you. Okay. And as far as capacity, you know, you look at the plant and equipment, does that contractor have uh, equipment and do they have a storage yard? Do they have everything they need to be able to successfully complete the jobs that they're outbidding on? Um, contractors backlog, what does the backlog look like? You know, what does the accounts payables, accounts receivables look like? They want to make sure that you're not trying to take on too much. You know, this is one of the areas, you know, I never understood when a surety told me that when I was just in the industry, that they don't want a contractor to grow too fast. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's up to that contractor. As long as they can do the work, they should be able to grow. No, you don't want to grow too fast. That's when, you know, if you're a small contractor trying to grow to that medium-sized contract contractor, the paperwork gets thick, I know. But there's other things that also gets thick. And one job could take out a whole backlog of jobs on funding. So you want to make sure that you have the necessary capacity to fulfill the jobs that you're going after. And the last C is capital. The measure of a contractor's financial ability to assume risk of business activity. Does the company have equity? What's the working capital position look like? You know, what's the cash flow look like? What's the bank line look like? Every surety is going to want a, a contractor to have a, back, a bank line, but they don't want the contractor to live off of the bank line. They want to see, okay, you know, maybe you, one of your GCs or you miss getting in a payment late and you're going to have to rely on that bank, bank line to get you through for a month. Well, when that payment come in, they're expecting to see that that bank line is getting paid off. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Hello? I believe we can, Don. Try speaking. Don, can you hear us? Okay, I got it back now. 
sorry about that. They don't want to see you living off of your bank line. They want to see that you have a bank line, but you also should know that if you do have a bank line and there is a claim that happens on a bonded job, the surety is going to that bank line first. They will probably max it out and put a hold on it until the issue is resolved. So you just have to know that about the bank line as well. Financial statements. Uh, you have three types of financial statements that sureties are looking at. The first one is a compilation, a reviewed financial statement, and audited financial statements. A compilation is typically for job or for a contractor that's bonding less than a million. Um, you know, the surety may ask for you to get a compilation at year end. That's the least expensive of the three. Um, nothing is being verified. A reviewed financial statements, when you get to the point of where you have or need a million dollar bond or you have backlogs, the surety is gonna ask for you at the next year end to get a reviewed financial statement. And you know, I know a lot of companies don't like to pay for them, but this is what allows the surety to verify all of the financial statements that you've been giving them throughout the year. This is the measurement to see, okay, can we rely on their accounting? Can we rely on the bookkeeping services? Can we rely on their internal systems? The reviewed statement is what is gonna give that determination. And it's usually for when you are asking for bonds over a million dollars or your backlogs over a million dollars, the CPA will, I mean, the surety will ask for reviewed statements. Um, audited statements, you don't see very often, but it's usually when you're around the 100 million in revenue mark that a surety will then require you to start to get audited financial statements. But it's not always. Most of the time, the audited financial statements are driven by financial institutions that, you know, maybe your bank wants to see or someone other than the surety. The surety just ends up being the beneficiary of that audited um, statement. Okay, I've got a question for you. Sure. Um, it's how often should you get a compilation, audit, or reviewed? Um, as long as you are doing bonded work and have a surety relationship, you will have to get that every year. Every year, uh, most of the clients that I deal with are doing review financial statements, and it's expected every year to get that review financial statement. So, you know, I can tell you that the cleaner your books are, the less expensive either one of these are gonna be. If they have to go in and do a lot of cleanup, it gets to be very expensive, but um, every year you're gonna be requested to get one of the three. Thank you, no other questions. Okay. Now we're getting into the underwriter's eyes. It's looking at the account from how underwriters are viewing. Oops, I forgot to take that out. So when you say what else matters, the financial statements, the internal systems, and the case percentages, financial allowance, what's important? You know, profitability is very important, just as working capital, equity, and the quality of accounts receivables, ages, aging of receivables, work in progress. Um, most of the time, you can do a quick glance on what you may be able to get bonded by, by taking the total current assets and subtracting total current liabilities, that's gonna give you a number. If you multiply that number times 10, that's gonna be the aggregate program that they may allow you to, um, that a surety will offer you work. So if you've got $100,000 in working capital, the surety will more than likely give you a million dollar bond, but it also depends on your, your backlog. Um, they wanna see that the, the company is, is has equity in it. And this is the hardest part because to me, equity says you got to pay taxes. Um, and, you know, we see this at the end of the year when we're coming to the end of the year, companies are sitting on piles of cash and they don't want to pay taxes. They go and start looking for other things to do with that money. So if you go out and you buy a fleet of trucks because you got $100,000, well, you just bought a million dollars of bonding that you no longer have by trying to avoid paying taxes. The surety companies want to see that you are paying taxes because if you're paying taxes, that means that you're successful, you had a good year. Everything is flowing the way that it's supposed to flow. 
Um, typically, I see contractors get in trouble when they are trying to avoid paying taxes. It just doesn't work out. You're going to have to pay taxes. But we also understand that, you know, when you're at the end of the year and you're looking and you have the stock path, the stock piles of cash, reach out to your agent and say, hey, look, this is what I'm looking to do. What effect is that going to have on my bonding program? And it may be just a difference of even though you're cash rich, it's better for you to go out and put those vehicles on finance so that everything below the line isn't counting. The only thing counting is the amount that's due in the next 12 months. And it keeps your bonding up there, but it allows you to go out and get those new vehicles. Some contractors don't like that and I get it, but you have to manage that. And the best way to manage that is to have that close relationship with your agent and the communication with the surety so that you don't make a move that's detrimental to the company as far as uh, bonding capacity is concerned. Work in progress, you know, that's, that's another one that's, it's one of the hardest ones to understand, but it's one of the most important pieces that your surety underwriters are looking at because that's given them the snapshot into the jobs you have going and they're comparing a lot of things in that work in progress schedule. You know, they're looking at profit. Are you maintaining the profit levels that you said you were going to make? You know, are you overbuilt or underbuilt on the job? There's a lot that goes into that work in progress. And they usually only ask for either monthly or qu quarterly. But you want to make sure that that work in progress is up to date and it's tying back into the financial statements. Also, you know, I'm not going in any particular order, but the quality of accounts receivables. When you send it in your aging receivables, just know that anything that's on the age receivable that's greater than 90 days will not be counted in your numbers. And, you know, what I've seen is accounts receivables, whether they're coming in or not, as long as they're 30 day, I mean, um, not 90 days old, we're going to count those in. That's going to increase your capacity. But if you have two or three hundred thousand dollars and that's past ninety days, the surety companies are going to ask, "Well, what's going on? How come you're not collecting all this money that you're due? Or is there a problem on one of the jobs? Because it usually ties into one of the jobs on the amount, depending on who it's from and when vendor it's from." So you want to be sure that you, when it comes time to give financial statements, you want to try to get all of your ninety day, your ninety plus. You want to get those cleared out. Otherwise, they're not going to be counted in your financial statements. Let's look at a couple of case percentages here. Um, one of the primary ratios that I just look at is in, in determining how much um, bond credit to extend is the working capital percentage case. Working capital is equal to current assets minus current liabilities, right? And, and that's the formula there. So working case percentage is equal to workers comp divided by the cost to complete backlog. Working capital divided by the cost to complete backlog. And these are just cases in bonds. So you get a, you get a feel for what these percentage cases means. And, you know, in today's world, we're using a 10% case, but, you know, if we head into a recession, like we may be heading, you're not going to get 10% you're going to get maybe five or six percent case so in a 10 percent case if you have a hundred thousand in working capital you can get a million dollars in bonding if you have two hundred and fifty thousand in working capital that's 2.5 in bonding on the single side just as if you have five hundred thousand you can get five million but that doesn't mean that if you have a long relationship with your surety these percentage cases goes down, which is a good thing. They're going to give you more bang for your buck in terms of surety credits once they are familiar with you and know that you are making money um, on your jobs. Internal systems. Uh, does a contractor have the ability to produce internal accurate financial statements? Um, this is something that you're going to be asked for a lot during the relation, during the tenure of the relationship with the surety. And you wanna make sure that you understand your own financial statements and you don't want to just print out a financial statements and send it to um, your agent without reviewing to make sure that, you know, in the checking accounts, make sure there are no negative balances on the financial statements. 
um, or just things that are out of line that could have been fixed with a simple fix. Because I know I look at them before I send them to the underwriters, but you do have some agents that as soon as they get them from you, they hit forward and send them to the agent or, or to the surety underwriter. And you want to make sure they're accurate because this is what gives you that ability when a surety company says, yeah, you know, we'll give you $3 million. And you already have three million, but another five hundred thousand dollar job pops up that is within your alley. You have the capacity for it. Well, as long as you have good internal systems, they're gonna continue to give you the surety credit. It's when you don't that they're gonna say, "No, we have to wait a little while longer." You already at capacity. Um, like I said, work in progress statements. They're going to make sure that you're handing those in with your financial statements and they want them to tie back in. They want them to be as accurate as possible. They're not going to be accurate to the penny, but as long as it's within the realm of, of the numbers, they're going to like that contract price. You know, I, I see a lot when companies are newer to the surety world and they're turning in um, the work in progress schedules or the bid bonds. Even if you know you're going to kill it on a job and make 35% profit margin, Give a conservative number. It's a lot easier to say, oh, well, yeah, I know I bid it at 10%, but we just did better versus 35% and you bring in 10% profit margin. The sureties are going to ask what happened. Why did we have the profit feed? I've never had a, a surety come to me and say, man, they bid it at 10, they made 25%. What happened? I get the question, they bid it at 35, they came in at 10%. What's wrong? Is there, is there, that's when they start looking at all of your bids to see, well, you know, do they have a history of saying that they're going to make more money than what their performance says? Um, total estimated cost, cost to pay, you know, bill to date, cost to complete. These are all things that are within this work in progress schedule that our sureties will use and looking at the progression of jobs for a contractor that has a bond out. Submission checklist. Um, I cannot tell you how important this is. And, you know, everyone that's completing a, con a surety questionnaire should really take the time out to do a good job in these questionnaires and everything that you're sending to the surety because it does play a part. You know, if they haven't met you, the only thing they know about you is the paper they're looking at. And if it's just a bunch of chicken scratch, handwritten, you can tell they did it real fast and then take the time to do it, then that's already putting up flags on your account that you don't want from a surety. Um, financial statements, they want to look at three years of financial statements. They want to do an analysis on your prior work and on different things within this financial statements to see um, how the last three years have gone, to see if you're profitable, see if you're keeping current work in progress schedules. Uh, they're going to want the personal financial statements of all owners. Take some time, make sure you put in everything on these because it's, um, you have some companies on the per personal financial side. If you have a lot of wealth on the personal financials, some sureties will lend off of that as well, in addition to the company financials. Other sureties will want you, you know, if you come up to a situation to where you need more in the company, they want you to put that money in the company. You can put it in separate accounts, you don't have to touch it, but they feel that if you're taking it from the personal and put it into the company, then you're more committed to the process and to the surety. And that's what they're looking for. Um, get copies of, copies of business and personal bank statements. They wanna see it. When you have good jobs, make sure you get good reference letters from the owners that you're working with and put them in a file because they wanna see that people like the work that you've done for them and they've written a good note about you. Um, also the articles of uh, the company articles and operation agreements they're gonna to wanna to see and the um, copy of the bank line of credit they're gonna to wanna to see as well. John, I've got a quick question for you. Okay. Um, working with all the clients that you've been working with in the past, do you have an estimated cost for audited financials? Well, I know I don't have for audited financials, you know, the client, I have only had one client that had to produce audited financials and I think they were about $40,000 a year. But what I can tell you is a compilation should always be under 
I think five thousand dollars, depending on the account. Usually, five and under is a compilation. A reviewed can be anywhere from six thousand to fifteen thousand. Sometimes even twenty thousand. It just depends on uh, the condition of the financial statements. Okay, thank you. And this is just a checklist to you. They're going to want to see copies of your contractor's license, copies of trust agreements, copies of continuity plans, uh, a bid contract information if bonds is needed. But the continuity plan, everyone that has a family should have some kind of continuity plan in place if, God forbid, something happens to one of the important owners or one of the key employees, what happens? In the case of an owner, you know, if you don't have a continuity plan in place, does that mean the husband or the wife comes into the into the business and now you have to work with someone that don't know anything about the business? Uh, a continuity plan lays out what the steps are in the event something happens to an owner or a um, key employee. Oftentimes, the continuity plans are backed by life insurance. A lot of companies put life insurance on their key people because they know if something happens to that person, um, it costs money to bring someone in to fulfill that, that position and get them trained up on the systems. Here we've got one more question. Um, can a company self bond the project? Companies can soft bond, but it's not recommended. Um, typically that process starts out, if you have a bid bond, if it's a 10% bond, you're going after a million dollar project. You're gonna to have to give them a cashier's check for um, $100,000. If you are awarded the job and you can't produce the final or you don't have that million dollars, you just put a lot of money on the line. Um, so you can bond, in terms of give, you know, a letter of credit or some type of bond, it's just not recommended. There's a lot of risk involved, a lot of money that's up front. But yes, it's possible to bond a project yourself. Thank you, Don. Mm -hmm. And I play golf, and that's the end of my presentation. Hopefully, um, you guys enjoyed some of the information there. If you need more information, please don't hesitate to give me a call, even if it's just a question. I don't mind answering questions. Don, do you guys uh, at Propel provide some kind of like technical assistance or like support for your clients or potential clients? You know, for instance, you know, like companies who probably need some help with a you know back office and stuff like that no that's not something that we provide lily because we are trying to manage our back office mm -hmm. that you know all of the support staff that makes it possible for the the contractors to get their insurance or make policy changes or whatnot so no we don't offer any support in that manner we do offer risk management support. You know, if you are having some issues in certain areas, we can put together some good programs for you to help you avert that. Like I'm working on one now where um, I had one of my electrical companies buy another electrical company. The company that they bought had a bad mod and had a frequency problem in a lot of different areas. Um, we are working with them to come up with a plan so that they can reduce some of the things that's causing their workers' comp mod to go up in that particular company. And also, Don, sometimes, you know, when I work with a lot of, um, you know, minority-owned folks, woman-owned, historically always have challenges, right, to obtain bonds. I mean, they have blemishes, credit history, or everything is not perfect. There's, like, situation where, you know, it probably cost the the financial statement whatever to make the company doesn't look good i mean are it's propel is it gonna review the company just because of okay your credit score is not good enough okay you're not gonna be like you know eligible working with us i mean is there something like more consideration to look at case by case maybe there's also some strength from the firm that you guys want to take on as a client it's, you know like when you like work with the banks you know some banks like eh, we're not working. I mean, construction industry always have challenges in to work the bank. Um, some of the banks they're not really construction construction friendly, you know. So I mean, do you guys have any like you know strategy on working, um, you know, with this? That's 
take these off. Can you hear me? Yes. So that's done typically on a case by case basis with the agent. Like if I have someone that their credit is not in that great of shape, I would work with them to say, hey, let's let's work on a few things before we approach the surety. If they tell me that, you know, the sureties or the credit is bad or that, you know, whatever is going on. I mean, some of my clients that I have today, I start working with them four or five years prior to them getting their first bond. And typically you just, a business owner have to be patient. In the bonding world, nothing happens overnight and there's a process. But if you follow that process from an agent, we can get you bonded. But I can tell you, Lily, that the easiest way to get a bond is a credit check bond. Oh. You can get almost a million dollars by having close to a 700 uh, credit score. That's the fastest, easiest. You don't have to go and try to get... Well, for a million dollars, there are a couple of things that they want to see, just a financial statement. But $500,000 bond, if you have good credit, you can go and get that just with them running your credit, saying that you have good credit and you're paying your creditors. We can get that bond. Okay. The fast check bonds aren't meant to be a regular operating bond line, but it gives us a place to go until whatever has happened has been corrected and we can get them into a standard surety. And sometimes, Lily, you may have a company that has good credit, their financial statements just aren't, you know, there's not a lot of girth. Sometimes we use the SBA for those accounts because the SBA is going to back the surety on if in case of default. There's a little bit more paperwork in the rate is a little bit more. But sometimes, you know, I've had companies in the SBA and that's how they started with this SBA bond. It's not all bad. That's a good starting place for some young companies. So um, if the credit score is not perfect, is that possible to get a cosigner? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Banks will take cosigners all day long. Okay. Any other I questions? Have Any other I questions? have a question. Okay, go I have ahead. A question. This is Sharon. Um, I have a question in regards to insurance. So, uh, what's the difference between owner controlled insurance uh, and the getting insured by the uh, company? So, you're talking about OSEPs and CSEPs versus regular general liability insurance? Right. So an OSEP or a CSEP is saying that I have this project and all of the insurances for all of the construction taking place, I'm gonna go buy that insurance. And so when I have an OSEP in place, whatever the payrolls or subcontract costs that's on your policy, we're not charging you for that. You don't have to report that to your regular general liability policy because it's being captured in that OSEP or CSEP policy. Oh. Okay. That means now, like, if you're working on a CSEP policy or on a CSEP or OSEP project, Sharon, and let's say there was a mistake made that causes a loss from your company, mm -hmm. your insurance company that you have for your company isn't going to be touched because it's going to go on that OSEP or CSEP loss runs. Or I loss see. Okay. So does that follow you at all? The OSEP and CSEP? No, it doesn't. Okay, and then why did why do they actually get that? Because of risk. Um, sometimes it's like typically you see them, let's say, on a condo, right? Mm, okay. If you have a condo and you do it just with regular CGL insurance, after that condo is completed, usually it happens at a year five or six, depending on what state you're in. You know, and whenever that statute of limitations run out. Mm -hmm get the attorneys in there, they're going to go and they're going to list every subcontractor that worked on that condo project in a class action lawsuit, whether you have anything to do with the claim or not. And your insurance company is going to have to pay to defend to say, hey, look, my client installed the carpet. You're talking about water damage. We had nothing to do with that. Right? Okay. So it gives that ability. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. You're welcome.
John, can you explain just a little bit about SubGuard? Like a lot of like my clients, you know, they talk to the primes and they said, hey, you know, we could piggyback our bonding. I was just like, you know, maybe, you know, something that you could share with, you know, our firms. If yeah, we talk sub, about. SubGuard is a subcontracted default insurance program on the bonds and what happens there is a uh, big GC, if they're using sub guards, they're doing a lot of volume and they are vetting or minimizing their risk of subcontractor defaults. Um, in the beginning phases of projects, they have to underwrite all of the subcontractors to a certain standard. If that subcontractor defaults, they have an insurance in place where the project is not going to get hurt or the general contractor is going to get hurt due to a subcontractor failure. That's nuts and bolts is what subguard is, Lily. Does that answer is your it question? easy for a subcontractor? I feel like when people talk about it, it's something that it's easy to be done, but I heard from some of the primes, it's not easy. No, it's not easy. And one of the, the major misconceptions about SubGuard is that there's no underwriting and any subcontractor can go and work for a general contractor that has a SubGuard policy in place. And that's not true. They are underwritten because there's usually large deductibles that involve with uh, SubGuard. So the loss has to reach a certain limit before SubGuard kicks in to help that GC recover those costs. So that's why we encourage all of our firms to get their, you know, to understand what your bond capacity is and, yeah. and then to build that bond capacity because subguard can become another, okay, we just got, I guess we just have real talk right now, right, Lily? Because subguard can become another barrier to your participating on a project because yeah. you cannot bond, okay? So we've got to make sure that our, our firms can bond and if you can't, we need to understand what is stopping you from bonding so that we can work on those things so that you can get bonded. Okay, a no today doesn't mean it's a no forever. Remember that. It's just no for today and it'll be a yes, you know, another day. But we've got to work on the issues that, you know, we have um, that's stopping you from becoming bonded. And it's good to understand what your bond capacity is so that you can talk to people about that. You know, like, this is what I can do. This is, you know, this is what I've got a bond for. The other thing that I wanted to mention too is with the SBA, um, Don had mentioned that the, you know, the amount is a little bit higher, right? Because they're guarding against risk and all of that. So you've got to know if you're going to go work for a prime contractor, what are they willing to um, pay you for that bond? Okay. Because we've got Tom Cole that's coming up after this. And we need to find out when that happens, if our bond rate is higher than what the prime is willing to pay you for, then how do we build in the contingency to cover that? Okay, because I've seen that happen. Like, you know, they're saying, okay, you up to 1.5, but then you're being charged two. And so how do you build in that 0.5? You shouldn't be paying to be on the job. Okay, so let's make sure we start asking Mr. Cole about that. And then um, Don, I've got a question for you. Have you seen anything that's happening with um, COVID and how our firms are being, um, I don't know, affected by it? Um, as far as COVID, firms are being affected, but there's no, there hasn't been any cases yet because, you know, with COVID and with the way that insurance works, if there were insurance that guarded against COVID, and there are in some cases, there has to be a tangible loss. There has to be something, property damage that, you know, that was damaged that's causing the loss and not an airborne pathogen, right? So, you know, it's causing some disruption for sure, but, you know, what the conclusion is going to be of how it all shakes out is still a big unknown. But I also, uh, Tanya, wanted to mention, none of you should be paying for your bonding premium or your insurance premiums. You know, I hope that you guys are doing, I hope you have your rates for all of the GL class codes and your subcontract rates from your agent so that you're putting that into your bids um, for whatever payroll, whatever subcontract cost you're going to use on that job. You need to be putting that on your bids to make sure you're capturing that cost because if you're bidding the job at 
you know, 10%, but you don't have bond or insurance costs in that bid, you're not going to make 10% as soon as you step onto that job because you have to make up, you have to account for those costs. So, you know, that's what I tell my clients all the time is you shouldn't, yeah, your insurance premium may be whatever it is, but if you out or if you are, are out there doing work, every job should be paying for your insurance premium by line item. Okay, then we've got another question from our, one of our participants, um, and he wants to know, do you bond joint venture entities? Yes, we do. And it's not, it's, not a, it's not a question of if I bond joint venture entities. Um, it's more so because usually when there's a joint venture, sometimes both, both parties are strong, or sometimes you have a strong party financially and a strong party that can do whatever type of work it is. Typically, um, the stronger financial side want to go with their surety, or sometimes they just want to do it all new and put together a new program for it. And both of those can be done, both scenarios. But what do you mean by putting uh, together a new program, Don? Well, when I say put together a new program, let's say you have a surety company with your company and I have one with my company. You don't want to use his company or that company. You want to put the financials together and come up with a completely new bond program for the specific joint venture itself meaning you're gonna set up new company, new bank accounts specifically for that joint venture and that joint venture is what's gonna go after projects. And do you see that happening all the time like that? Uh, it depends on the situation. You know, joint ventures, um, they are formed for a lot of different reasons. I don't mm -hmm. see as much as I used to see probably 10 years ago, um, but yeah, it is something that's still been done. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. One Any more other question? questions? Go oh, ahead. I have another one with my client. So I have a client who has a potential and he gets certified, you know, as an 8A, service disabled veteran owned, being approached with prime contractors um, for joint venture or, you know, help with the bonding. So is there any uh, suggestion or tip for this kind of client? Because I've been trying to tell the person like, hey, you need to get your bonding first instead of relying in, on this big giant corporation to, you know, help you to go after the project. Is there any like, you know? You know, that that's not a bad thing. And I've seen it happen literally to where you have someone new into the 8A and they're going to rely on a bigger, someone that used to be an 8A or someone that's current in the 8A. Um, there's a couple of things that I want to urge caution on. You want to, who do you want to have to be in control? Usually it's the bigger firm that wants to handle all the control, but if they're getting the project because of a certification, that's terms for you to have a little bit more control. You also want to, for the smaller firm, you want to bond to the maximum that they can get bonding within that relationship to help build capacity. And as far, you also want there to be a sharing of internal systems so that the newer person can learn from that bigger firm on how they're estimating, how they're, what softwares they're using. You wanna be privy to all of that and be able to use that after that joint venture is over. All of the collateral you wanna be able to use, you want copies of because you wanna implement in your environment. And the only way to do that is you have to get that understanding up front that they're going to be open with all of whatever tricks and trades that they have. And make sure that that agreement is in your favor. You know, make sure you are going and checking with legal and attorney to make sure there's not anything that's hidden or something that you may not quite understand that could come back to hurt you later on in the relationship. Don, that is excellent advice for, for the firms. You know, what you're saying is, is absolutely true. You've got to understand what the return on your investment of time is worth. Right? Mm -hmm. It's your certification. They're coming in. They're asking you to help them with this. Uh, we'll give you the bonding. It's got to be more than that. Like Don said, you know, you've got to have access to, I don't know, Blue Book, you know, so you can do equipment. Um, you can start estimating what your equipment cost is going to be. Whatever they have, you know, you need to start talking about that. That was really great advice, Don. Thank you so much. See, that's why... 
that's why we participate in all of these. You know, we've been doing this for how long, but every single time, if you listen, there's a nugget that is just being dropped all the time. And, and that's a great nugget to drop, Don. Thank you so much. I appreciate what you just had to say there. Collateral Anybody else? Either. You have to be able to share it. Otherwise, the, you know, if one company is doing all the bidding, but they're not showing you how they're arriving at their numbers, then that smaller contractor isn't learning anything. Right. Just being used. And then after your eight years, then they just kind of kick you to the curb. Correct. Right. I mean, that's what we've seen happen in the past, too. So when you go in, right, be smart about it. And I want you to think about something. And, and you know, we can't see a lot of people's faces on screen, but I want you to think about this. Do you qualify the people you work for as hard as they qualify you? Before you sign that contract with them, have do you have a list of compliance items that you need from them, such as their bond information? the job site information. Do you have all of that? Do they provide it to you? Are you so happy to just sign a contract that you're just willing to risk everything? Yeah, know the reputation of your partners because oftentimes, you know, it happens all the time where, you know, they'll say, oh, this company or that company, they're hard on subcontractors. This company, this company, they're hard to work with. Well, if you've heard it and you still go and you sign that contract with them anyway, did you not believe them or what did you expect, right? Put some contingencies in place that's going to give your company protection. And Don't be that one person who's trying to disprove it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is a true statement right there, Don. I mean, I've seen people do that. They, they, no, maybe with me, it'll be different. No, it's not. <laughs> here and, then, and then here we come. We got to come in and step in. So... Don't be that person. Thanks, Don. Yeah. The only one thing that I would say for all of your firms that's I in the 8A program, make sure you're ready because I know that just the system alone for the people working the 8A program is a learn experience all by itself, right? So if you get into the 8A program and it takes you three years just to learn the system, then you've wasted three valuable years for the 8A program. If you don't have any kind of bonding capacity, the 8A program may not be for you right now, but you can start to prepare your company because going into the 8A program, you're going to be required to post bonds. If you can't post bonds, because I've had clients that's in the 8A program, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of jobs that you could potentially do, but any job you do is going to have to take bonding. And you can't use all your bonding in the 8A to where you don't have any capacity outside of the 8A, which is one of the requirements of the 8A. There's, you know, a balance that you have to do 8A work versus non-8A work. Just my thoughts. Yeah, I, I just want to add a little bit, you know, um, for all the construction companies in this workshop today, please reach out to us. You know, I don't want to be like, you guys going to reach out to me when you need the bond, you know, like next week. Uh, work with us. We have the support service. We don't have a lot of funding, but we do have a lot of uh, agency behind us to help. You know, Tanya and I and, and Dawn will be happy to help. Like, you know, you probably don't want to work with Dawn, but if you want to apply for bonding, increase bonding capacity, reach out to us if you need some help. That's why we're here. So, but if you want to work with Dawn, it's even better. You know, we, we, we will help. Like uh, I said before, we do have funding to support companies who are serious, really committed to apply for the bonding. I've been I've been doing this bonding education program workshop for almost 12 years. Right, Don? I mean, we started- I mean, like, I've known you 12 years, really? Yeah. Yes. Time flies. So, please come to us if you need some help with estimating, if you need some help with you know bookkeeping. I know it's too good to be true, but the only thing that I really want from you guys to apply for your bonding for your company and then you become, you know, bonded. That's my credit. I didn't get anything. <laughs> the credit, you, is you get you money. Questions <laughs> along the way. Guys, feel free to reach out to me. You don't have to be a client for me to answer yeah. a question. I'm going to answer it honestly. I don't believe that to degrade another agent's work to get business is good business. I'm going to tell you the truth. You may not like what I have to tell you. I'm going to tell you the truth, but I also can provide. Um, we can create a plan for you to get to where you want to be. Um, 
I accept almost all clients, not all clients. I, we can't do very small companies, but I'm always here to help. I'll never turn down to one. As long as they're willing to listen and learn, I'm here to help them. Okay, so somebody who is a participant today, and Tom Cole, I know you know this answer, so you know you cannot answer this because you're you're a presenter today. But one of our firms who is online right now, can you tell me what Don's job is? So Don Shanklin is a is a bond producer, and he also sells insurance. Can somebody tell me what his job is for you? What does he do, Victor? How about you? He to unmute. So what he does is he helps. Is Victor going to speak? Yeah, he just unmuted. Oh, okay. I believe it's um, someone that can support your bonding um, issues in different ways. Okay. Sharing? So he's actually part of our team uh, because he helps us to be able to uh, bid uh, on projects, get bonding and our insurance so that we can actually execute and perform and meet the uh, requirements and be responsive uh, when we're turning in um, bids, quotes or RFPs and being uh, prepared to you know, do our, our work. Okay, great. How about you, Ophelia? Are you there? Can you hear us? Oh, wait, maybe we got to ask you to unmute. Ask Mari. Mari, we can see you. Um, I was going to say the same thing, and um, he is, he, it's kind of like the, the middle way, and he also He's also kind of a, um, a intermediary as you grow your business, right? So if you take on too much work and you're asking for too many bonds, then he's probably the person that's going to be like, oh, slow this down. Or your financials don't look um, like we're going to be able to get through, all, through this work of scope that you're trying to do. So let's, I'd like another set of eyes for your, for your, for your building capacity and making sure that you build it in a responsible and sustainable way. Okay, another participant chimed in via chat. Um, really great comment from Ralph. And he says, successful producers, insurance speak for service providers should also be trusted advisors, right? It's somebody that you need to be able to trust and be able to work with. That was a great comment. Thank you, Ralph. Um, the way I look at a bond producer is they are part of your work family, right? Because you need to be able to tell them whatever you need to tell them and they need to be able to help you with whatever is going on within your company, help you understand it. You know, you need your banker to be on that team. You need your attorney to be on that team and you need your bond producer to be on that team. So that when you're thinking about doing something, you can call them up and you can say, hey, listen, I'm thinking about doing this. How will this affect my bonding? How will this actually affect my line of credit, right? And a bond producer like Don, he needs to have great relationships over at the surety. And so when he packages my company, right? So that he knows, okay, this is what her company does. This is the people who have an appetite to do that, to bond that type of company. That's what Don's job is, is he needs to understand that surety world, who's looking to, who's looking to bond me specifically. George, you have anything to share, George Frost? You're on mute. Um, yeah, you gotta unmute. There you go. Well, I, I think it's great that you're providing this information and, and done. That was great. Because uh, I yeah. think a lot of small contractors uh, really have a challenge with them on the bonding side. Insurance period, but bonding still a challenge. So great. Thank you. Okay, we've got Destiny. Destiny, you have anything to share with us? Anything from you, Lily? No, I just feel like a lot of like companies, construction companies, especially our clients, they're confused sometimes about bonding and they kind of like mix with the insurance. And then and then sometimes the um, mindset, they're 
pretty like intimidated by it, you know, because they feel like, oh, I'm not ready. You would never get ready. But if you want to grow your capacity and, you know, and be successful, that's part of the, the challenge that you have to take on being a construction company and then bid on a, on a, a public sector projects. So I just want to make sure that everybody, you know, have the same um, thinking now that, you know, you're running construction company, bonding is important. I always, you know, talk to firms and they're like, they just don't like the paperwork, but I don't like it when somebody come to me like a day before the bid or a week and like, hey, I need the bonding. And then I scrambling around trying to make, you know, everything work, but it's not that way. I'll take a week, but a day is challenging, but sometimes it still can be done. I mean, but, you know, really, if you think about all the people that I'm in contact with on a daily basis, I'm a great referral source for, you know, if, you know, I get calls from contract like Don, I just ran into this. Do you know of anyone that run into the same problem? If I don't, I can check with my team around me to see if they have, we usually can come up with an answer. We work in collective groups at Propel. So the expertise expands really, really wide. Um, if I'm, I, I don't know all that there is to know in insurance or bonding, but I have a team that I can go when it gets outside of my expertise, I can bring in help, someone that has expertise in a certain area. But the one thing that I want you guys to keep in mind as far as building surety capacity Surety companies want to let you grow two to three times your largest project on a single side. So if the biggest job you completed is $100,000, a surety company can get comfortable with a single at two or 300,000, but to ask for a five or 600,000 when 100,000 is the biggest job you've ever completed, it's going to be an uphill battle to try to get that bond approved. Patience. We can do things. We just have to be patient. I don't know patience either. I came to Oregon State. I wanted to start my freshman year. They say, you're not ready yet. I says, I'm ready. I started later in the year and I was ready, but I didn't realize how unready I was. So you have to be patient. Okay, It'll so at, at this point, <laughs> sorry, at this point, um, we've got a lot of firms online and we can't see your faces. So if you don't mind getting on video and just introducing yourself, tell us who you are and what you do. Tracy. <laughs> Hit the button again. You're still muted, Tracy. There, there you go. go. Oh, no, you're muted again. Yeah. You guys know I ain't good at this stuff. That's okay. Now can you hear me? Yes, yep. Ma okay, Tracy Freeman, TNT Traffic Control. So I do traffic control. Very nice. Okay, how about you, Kurt? Oh, wait, hold on. Yep, there you go. Hello, uh, I'm with uh, Lesnoy LLC. Uh, we do environmental construction um, and uh, we do other forms of federal construction as well. No, you're nice. welcome. I have some of you environmental guys in my book. All right. Ezekiel, I saw you last week and you didn't say anything. What's your company name and what do you do? Hi, I'm Ezekiel. Uh, I have a com company, 360 Healthcare. I'm a construction general constructor. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you nice. doing private or are you doing commercial? I do uh I do both. I do residential and commercial. Okay. Well yeah, yeah. New How about you, Steve? I work for Celebrity Access Transport. It's a uh, transportation company that primarily moves uh ADA folks. We work for the cruise ships and move people that are in wheelchairs from SeaTac back and forth to the cruise ship and also for the school districts. Um for overload for the uh, for the ADA ADA buses, and then we also have vans and cars and and big tour buses and all sorts of stuff. And uh, we're recently, you know, we've been so busy running around like crazy for years, but 
well, not too many years, but now we're trying to get into the, uh, you know, thinking that maybe we could provide uh, for construction projects that we see on the freeway there, like the 405 project that go all the way up and down 405, that maybe we could provide the transportation for the workers from their lot back and forth. Or We're not really sure. We're trying to kind of learn what's going on here. Oh, absolutely, Steve. And um, I'll tell you that the first place you should start looking or watching is airports because they're usually off-site parking and they usually have a transportation company that moves them around. But yeah, thank you. what do you need to do if you want more information? You got to call us <laughs> so we can start talking to you. Okay. okay, how about Ralph? What's going on with not you? Not to interrupt, but real quick, I we came on late and I don't know who you are when you say- I'm Tanya Mota. So um, I'm a business advisor with the Northwest Small Business Transportation Resource Center. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Sorry to interrupt. Keep going and we'll figure out who you are in a little bit. And the All righty. Hi, Ralph. Hello, Tanya. Hi, Lily. Hello, everyone. My name is Ralph Ibarra. I'm president of Diverse America Network. I'm a successful consulting company where I help corporations and institutions be inclusive, diverse, equitable, and accessible particularly when it comes to public works contracting. So I've done a number of different uh, activities to help small, diverse businesses really understand what they're getting into, not the least of which, of course, is what Don spoke to, and that is making some informed decisions on how you make sure that your business operations are such where you can get the required bonding necessary, whether it is mm -hmm. a bid bond, performance bond, you name it, etc. So I've been around for a little while and I always enjoy participating in these types of forums because you always pick up something new, something fresh. Thank you so much, Tanya. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Ralph. And Ralph has been around for a long time as a um, consultant, George Frost. So, you know, there's expertise on this, uh, on this panel as well, or this call. Um, Amanda, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute. Okay, there you go. Go ahead, Amanda. What? <clears throat> Sorry, do you want me just to introduce myself? Yep, and your company. Okay, I'm Amanda Dayton. I own a small woman-owned business uh, called Revere Marine. I do project management engineering consulting for the marine industry. Mm -hmm. uh, I work with Vigor Industrial. I just finished um, a short-term project with Sea uh, Machines Robotics. Um, they teamed with FOSS Maritime to work on a, a military contract. Um, so a lot of my background is in estimating and project management and project engineering for shipyards and uh, offshore, offshore uh, companies. Nice to meet so, you. Sorry I'm late. 